by Dr. Kulkarni. Uh, my name is Srinivas, but I've known uh, Yogesh Kulkarni for some time. Uh, he is very, very knowledgeable. And in that rare combination of both breadth and depth, and this is, this is not common. Uh, and he's also concerned about people. So I don't know if you have followed any of his LinkedIn uh, posts. How, how many people have mm -hmm. s seen some of his posts or read them? Okay, one person. All right. All I can say is sing out a lot. So please, after the session, do you know, follow him. It is certainly worth it. I cannot give a higher recommendation from anyone uh, e that easily. Uh, so, without taking too much time, uh, he is a person with a lot of background and before he was in, uh, became an expert in AI and data science, he also was, I think, working on uh, graphics and graphics, uh, yeah. engineering software and systems, right? Correct. So his PhD is somewhere in that area, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's absolutely fantastic. So over to you, Yogesh. The floor uh, is yours. Thanks, Srinivas. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Okay. Uh, so the title is Mid-Career Transition to Artificial Intelligence or Data Science, right? Uh, I'm actually a mechanical engineer and did that for 20 years, software development. Uh, what Srinivas mentioned as graphics, CAD-CAM, if you have heard this term, yes. computer aided design and manufacturing. That I did for two decades. Then transition to machine learning. So I'm actually eligible to talk about this. <laughs> First few, one question rather, how many of you have programmed in scikit-learn, TensorFlow or PyTorch? Scikit-learn, TensorFlow, or PyTorch. This talk is not for you guys. Okay. <laughs> the talk is for the rest of the guys. <laughs> so, uh, I have divided this talk, few minutes of background, then whole lot of what is AIML actually. Okay, Very basics of AIML. People use these terms very synonymously, I am doing AIML, whatever. Right? What is it all about? And then towards end, about 10-15 minutes, I'll talk about how to transition to that. A learning path, a roadmap sort. Okay? Some statistics. So, basically the idea is, most, rather half of the US workforce, workforce is still earning below poverty line. And this thing, is happening because of what is called as automation. Things are getting automated day by day. And this is of course CAGR, rate at which this automation is taking place. <coughs> Some statistics. Which things are getting automated? Things which are repetitive in nature. Right? Very simply, first few slides are non-technical, easy to follow, no issues. <laughs> Later, things will become a little odd. Okay. So, uh, data entry, mechanical things, repetitive things, those will get automated anyway. And we are, we are seeing that anyway. These things are getting automated. Things that are not getting automated is this thing to look at, basically. Because that's the way we are going to find our next career. If it is getting automated, we are at loss. So basically, now this thing, although I've mentioned cognitive, creative, and human, <coughs> these things are still on the verge of getting automated. And that's the topic today, OK? Although they have been mentioned as yet to be automated fully, but they are still on the verge of getting automated. So wherever intelligence, human intelligence is required, it is still to be conquered by machines. Partially. And then, of course, where there is human touch needed, these things are yet to be automated and cannot be automated very easily. What, what things are happening around us? Some technological changes happening. AI deluge, deluge is storm. We were all 
engulfed in that storm because of the November event that happened two years back, chat GPT. AI is coming in a big way and everybody is asking, are you doing AI? Basically, right? that's the thing. So AI is happening. AI is happening because of one thing, which is called as digitization. If everything was on paper, AI cannot happen. You follow, right? A data has to be there, a digital data has to be there on which AI can be built, isn't it? So digitization is the backbone. And of course, everything is getting remote, remote star. Even the medicine is getting remote, right? That's what we heard a few minutes back. So these are, I'm, I'm just giving you some landscape in the initial slide, which, what things are happening these days. Social things, there's too much interaction and there is no interaction. Are you getting what the point is? There's too much interaction, but still everybody is sort of lonely in some sense. Some roles are getting obsolete completely. In front of our eyes, few roles have gone obsolete. There are no more there. In my company, the earlier company, there used to be a QA department. Have you heard of it? QA? Right? It's no more there. Right? Because some things are getting automated fully. And another thing that is happening or going to happen for sure is lifelong reskilling. It's not that up to 21 years you have education and then you start earning. That's not going to happen. So these are some major changes that are happening these days and I'm giving this as a context to this talk. All right. So automation that we saw in the industrial revolution was automation of muscles, muscle power. The automation that is happening now is automation of brain, the cognitive power, the thinking power. And the idea is data science is aiding or helping that automation. For this talk, I'm considering data science equivalent to artificial intelligence, okay? And that's not the case. Data science is basically science of data, right? And today's artificial intelligence is actually data-based. There used to be AI, which was not data-based initially, earlier. So it used to be called expert systems now. That's not the case anymore. The popular one is data-based now. So these are the terms thrown around. I'm doing data science, I'm doing AI, ML, deep learning, everything, right? But what's the difference? What's the, what is it all about? Data science, of course, is science of data. The way to ask question is, what is not data science then? When there is no data, there is no science of data science. Meaning, if you don't have data, there is no AI now. So, the corollary of the statement is, you have to ask a company who is claiming to do AI, do you have data? And if they say no, you know what's happening, right? So data is essential for the today's AI at least. So that's the problem. By the way, do you know this picture, movie? So follow 30. So I've taken this picture just as a fun. So there's a huge problem happening in the industry today. Everybody is claiming to do AI, right? Irrespective of having data or not. So we are here today to understand, have a big lens to see if they are doing really AI and how to transition if you want to do that. So basically this talk is about what is AI? Initial part and then of course how to transition to it. Let, let's take a step back. Whenever you, you are doing a research or software development, what are you basically doing? You're doing problem solving. In problem solving, simplistically, in abstraction, you have some inputs, some desired outputs, and with your own understanding, logic, you write the transformation in between, right? Everybody okay with this? Although if you're not, even if you're not coding, that's the way you solve problem, you know some inputs, you know the desired outputs and you write some transformation. That's what research is all about also. This is actually finding a function. Slightly technical term, at least if you have done 12th, we had functions, fx, y is equal to fx, right? So this is, x is input, y is output. f is what we are trying to find. 
Everybody okay? And the synonymous terms, at least for this talk, are finding a relationship between input and output. This is the core idea of solving problem, right? That's the core idea. This is a transformation, input to output. This is also called model. Now we are coming to the familiar territory, machine learning. This is actually a model. What is model? Something has been trained so that given an input, unseen input, output is generated. So the idea is to find function, basically. Slightly theoretical, but I think we'll go fast about it. Some are very simple, right? Summer is coming up, ice cream sales will go up. Very simple. This is direct proportion. We, in, in colloquial language, it's a direct proportion. This is a very simple function, straightforward. This is f equal to ax kind of function, right? If the temperature goes up, my sales also goes up, right? A is positive here, y is equal to ax. Isn't it simple so far? Cause and effect kind of thing. But some functions are complex. So if we had simple function, you could write code for it, Python, C, C++, whatever. But some functions have too many variables. In the first case, we had temperature as one variable and ice cream sales was the output, one variable. But say if you are talking about uh, success in a business, success of a country, then there are too many input variables to talk, think about, isn't it? Hard problem to solve. Cause and effect again, but too many variables. In technical terms, it's called dimensionality of the problem. Dimensionality is too much. Meaning, it is not possible to solve it by hand, by some research, right? That's where the need to do inhuman things <laughs> comes into picture. And that's what leads to machine learning and deep learning, okay? There's definitely a need for AI. It's not hype. There is a need to do AI, and we will see specific cases where AI is applicable. Quiz time, okay? This, this is the equation we know of, right, everybody? I'm going to ask you a question. E is equal to mc square. Those who have done TensorFlow, please do not answer, <laughs> okay? So this equation, E is equal to mc square, which is input variable and which is output variable. I'll give you a hint. Whatever is on the left-hand side is output variable, okay? <laughs> That's what we know. What is the input variable here? Anybody? Those who go for, uh, say, M, M is the input variable. Those who go for C as input variable. Raise hands, don't be shy. It's video recording, that's why I think. <laughs> Your boss is going to know. Which is the input variable? Why I'm doing this is, this is fundamental. If you're trying to transition to AI, this has to be known to you. Because most of the work in AI engineer's journey is to massage X, massage the input variable. Find out which are the input variables. Calibrate them together. Find their correlations among themselves. And if you're not able to find an input variable in an equation, we have to pray, right? That's what we can do. So input variable here is M. C is actually a constant, isn't it? The speed of light. Now, slightly technical question. Is it a linear equation or a quadratic equation? Anybody quadratic? Something raised to two, right? Is it a linear equation or a quadratic equation? Those who go for quadratic, anybody? Raise the hand. Or linear? All right. It's linear because constant can be anything, right? Raised to n, doesn't matter. Why I'm saying this, if it is a linear equation, some ML models are directly applicable to it. If, the, if it is not, then some other models have to be chosen. So I'm bringing to the fact that if you are transitioning to AI, you should know at least this. Then we can think of moving to AI, okay? So the parameters here are, of course, the constants or whatever, coefficients. So far we saw equations which are deterministic, meaning given x, you'll get y. But some functions are probabilistic. 
given an image, this image may be 80% cat, 20% dog. How can this be possible in life, right? In real life, it is either a cat or a dog, isn't it? But all ML algorithms or all deep learning algorithms will tell you it is 80% cat. You have to live with it. And then find out which is most probabilistic. So all, almost all, I would say, algorithms in machine learning and deep learning, I'll talk about these terms a little later, ML and DL, are probabilistic in nature. Meaning what? The answers that you get from AI are probabilistic. Meaning what? They are not deterministic. Meaning what? You cannot claim that your answers are correct. Your answers are likely to be correct. Meaning while talking to your boss who is unaware of AI, you have to explain that these are probabilistic algorithms. Don't put my throat under the knife, isn't it? That's the idea. So some, some examples of probabilistic functions, given an image, whether this image is cat or a dog, if the tumor is benign or malignant. And of course, another classical example, playing chess. You may win by this move, may win by this move also. But what is the likelihood of doing this and then winning, right? So doing a chess move is intelligent, right? You have to have intelligence, not any Tom, Dick and Harry can play chess. At least good level of chess. So deciding a next move needs intelligence. Right? Now I'm slightly coming, you can understand, towards AI. What is AI? We have seen some context so far. You need intelligence. How do you get that intelligence, at least in case of chess? You play a lot of games. You know some rules, of course basic rules, and you play a lot of games. And you study past games. This past games thing is actually called data. So somebody is building intelligence on top of data or past experience. That's what same thing is applicable in machine learning and deep learning. They learn from past, meaning data. 15 minute card has come, I'll, I'll go fast. So um, that's so. My definition of artificial intelligence is, of course, my, so not rigorous. Whatever we consider as intelligent, if the software does it also, that's artificial intelligence, isn't it? Right? Playing chess, doing car driving, doing translation, all those things. Some facets of intelligence. Ability to think in various domains, not just cats and dogs. But you translation also, playing chess also, if you achieve that, that's intelligence. Producing something new, brand new, which people have not seen before. That's mark of intelligence. Why I'm showing this list? If your software starts doing this, then AI has arrived. If not, AI has not arrived. Another thing, detect the unseen. So if you learn driving in, in Pune, can you go to Solapur and drive? Right. You can. Right. So at least some intelligence is there. So that's what AI is. I'll go fast again. And as you can see, there are a lot of examples these days. Now Gmail gives you autocomplete of even a sentence now. GitHub Copilot can write code for you, isn't it? So that kind of intelligence has started coming in and it, it has become magical now, isn't it? Now if it is too good to be true, is it going to hurt us? That's the main anxiety people have. And we'll see, that's why we are doing transition to data science in some sense. This is the first diagram you should take it to heart. There are two diagrams. In this presentation, if you forget everything else, that's fine. This is the one. AI is a big umbrella. By the way, I'll give my presentation to these guys and you can take it from them. On my GitHub, I've made this open source. You can download and use it. So AI is a big term. As I said, if human intelligence is replicated, mimicked by software, that's AI. Machine learning is part of it. Now the question, there is some AI which is not machine learning. There's some green portion. What is that? Anybody, those who have gray hair at least can talk about it. It was my generation, 
expert system. This is a rule-based, hand-coded AI. Machine learning is data-based AI. And deep learning is just one part of machine learning where neural networks are used, simplistically. Right? That's the, this is the... So whenever somebody is talking about AI, ML, DL, you should at least know the differentiation. This is the... Can I take questions later? Sorry. I think this 10 minute thing is coming now. So this is the next slide, which is most important. Can anybody just decipher this slide? Traditional programming and machine learning programming. If you have understood this slide, that's it. Nothing else is needed. The rest is all details. So in traditional programming, you know the inputs, you write the logic by your own understanding, expertise, and output is generated. But in machine learning, by that means, deep learning also, at least in one subset, you feed input as well as output yes. as a training data and let the software figure out the logic. Can you see the dramatic dimensional opposite thing that has happened? That's why it is popular. The original case that I gave was some simple functions you can write logic. But if you are variables, you have no choice but to do this. Give all inputs, thousand inputs, output, and let it figure out the relationship. That's why it is popular. So there is a dire need, there is a specific need of AI. It's not hype, basically. But you need data. Why machine learning? You can quickly go through. Problems of high dimensionality, meaning inputs, there are too many inputs. Thousands, millions of inputs for weather prediction, whether there will be rain tomorrow, you don't have five variables. Right? You have hundreds of variables. So high dimension, that's called dimensionality for the mathematician guys. If you have hundreds of variables, it's hard to program manually. Right? You need that kind of brain. Third is, this statement is very, very rigorous and loaded. Third statement is rigorous and loaded. At least deep learning neural network, they claim a technique can model any function. I talked about function first, right? Any function given enough data. If you have understood, I think we can give you a toffee or something, right? Meaning there is a guarantee. However difficult, however complex the problem is, neural network can model it. Right? That's the guarantee. And of course, the reason for learning machine learning is money. Why now? Four things are needed. You need data, flood of data now. Sensors, internet, everything is there. A lot of data is available. Compute is available. You are not restricted to your laptop now. You, are, you have near infinite compute power. You have to just connect to cloud. And you should have money. Near infinite compute power. Algorithms are freely available. Scikit-learn, TensorFlow, PyTorch, things that I just mentioned, the free algorithms. And of course, people need it. There is a Gartner hype cycle. I'll let you read it later. It's a wonderful hype cycle. It talks about technology <coughs> trends. Currently, you may not be able to see it, at least 2023, at the peak of the hype, is generative AI. You use this hype cycles to monitor which technologies are coming up, which are going down, and that way you should decide the career. Not astrologer, right? That's the thing. <laughs> so, which roles are possible in AI? Now, so far, what we saw is, what is AI? Simplistically, isn't it? Now, you're trying to transition to AI. Which roles are possible? Three roles, in my opinion, are possible. So, that's data scientist. So, which personas? The three personas, user level. Typically, those who are managers doing Excel all day and who have subject matter expertise. They need something low code, no code platform. They're not into coding. Then that's okay. They have subject matter expertise. There are platforms which allow you to use AI or ML algorithms using just, just drag drop. Drag the data source, drag the ML algorithm, get the results, dumb. Done, right? But you need expertise, at least understanding which block to pull in, isn't it? That, that expertise is needed. So this is user level persona. Manager, subject matter expertise. 
So while transitioning, you can pick either of these three, okay, depending on your comfort. Second one is developer, those who can code. Those who can code should learn scikit-learn, TensorFlow, PyTorch. Right? These guys actually develop applications using these libraries. Okay? First one uses, second one develops. So you can, if you're already a programmer, that's the person, isn't it? If you're a C++ Java programming, learning Python is two hours job. You have to actually unlearn. Some things are there in C++ which are not there in whatever Python. So it's an easier transition. And third one is these guys, researcher, those who write PyTorch, right? Those who write activation functions. So depending, and for this you need mathematics, nothing else. And of course, computer science. So depending on where you are, you can choose either of this. And there, there are learning paths for this. Five? I'll, I'll wait here for this slide. I'm assuming many of you wish to transition. So I did it at my 45. Okay, some of you are still younger. So what are the advantages of transitioning mid-career? You have some domain. You are in finance, you are in pharma, whatever. You have some domain, whatever, 10 years, 20 years already under your belt. So you have domain expertise, you have maturity, you have communication, right? you have seen the world at least. And then you, sh you are able to do problem solving. These are assets for you. Or else what happens, you jump to AIML career and then you are a fresher. Right? You are, f you are competing with a COEP or PICT guy who can code you, code faster than you. Right? That's not the play. The play is you have these advantages. But the last part is because of whatever 10 years, 20 years, you have lost touch with mathematics. Some uh, mathematics would be needed, at least the understanding part of it. The inertia part. You have to start learning again, coding again. So that inertia, one has to come out. And of course, the ego issues. Can I be a fresher at 45? Right? These are the things. So why do you want to see? That's your own assessment. Is it for uh, money, future proofing and other things? Those, those you have to decide. My suggestions. If you want to trans transition to AI, ML, DL, now you know the meaning. My first suggestion is don't quit. Don't quit your job, do this whatever, 3 lakh, 4 lakh rupees course. No. While being in the job, Start doing this, free courses, whatever. Just to assess yourself with where you stand. Do you like it? Do you get it? Are you able to get it, basically, and like it? My suggestion is to find problems which are of your domain. If you're in finance, do whatever, loan modeling, whatever, default modeling. If you're in pharma, what molecular modeling. So be in the domain and then use ML as a problem solving tool for it, right? That's where the transition would be smooth, smoother. Many things can be done while, while transitioning to uh, AI ML. First, don't spend anything on the paid courses that I said. Of course, this is against those who are doing that now. Uh, lot of material is available on YouTube do playlists, see if you are able to code those things, depending on your person, of course. Uh, next is, uh, do what, actually there are three things, I will talk about it based on the persona. Okay. Three things are needed, basically. Mathematics, within mathematics, okay. Uh, within mathematics, statistics, linear algebra. Anybody, what is linear algebra? Vectors and matrices, 12th standard, okay? And third thing is calculus, derivatives. These three things are heavily used in AIML, okay? At least for, if you're trying to be developer and onwards, even for user level, at least some understanding may be needed. So mathematics is first. Second one is programming. If you're doing, as I said, C, C++, R, C, C++, Java, then learning R or Python should be relatively easy. I am biased towards Python, um, so Python. 
third thing is you have to know these ML algorithms. C8 algorithms at least to start with, say, um, regression, classification, clustering, dimensionality reduction. If you're getting scared by these names, then I think that's not the path for you, OK? <laughs> <laughs> and then I would suggest once you have done these basic algorithms, coded them, assignments, then you should do what are called as Kaggle competitions. K-A-G-G-L-E, Kaggle, free competitions. They've provided you data, and you can see others' solutions also. Okay, that's the wonderful part of it. You can copy other solutions, make some tweaks, and submit as yours. Right? That's completely possible. So see where you stand vis-a-vis -vis others. That's possible. These are Kaggle competitions. Whatever I'm telling you, all are free resources. Right? Third thing, once you are done, then you should pick up some data set, some problem from, from your domain. Do the solution and put, put it on GitHub, okay? so that people can see your code. And you, you should go to some meetup and talk about it. Getting what I'm saying? Do some solution, put it on GitHub, and then, then talk about it. This serves two purposes, your own clarity, and this helps in interviews, because you've already done so. Whatever you've done in the talk, these guys are going to ask the same thing. Right? What else? And people have asked questions freely for you right? during the talk. Your code is available for others to see. Right? That's your code. So everything is sort of sorted once you do these free steps. And then, of course, there are many specializations possible. We can talk about one-on-one -on -one if, if needed. By the way, this is very cryptic. But this is my sketch note of how to transition to data science. One page. Of course, search for it, Yogesh Kulkarni and transition to data science. I've got a medium article of it. Sketch note is a one page sketch-like thing having some important points. Whatever I spoke just today is there in this one slide. All right. So summary. That's probably my last slide, not last, semi-last. Mathematics, programming, algorithms, and do these things. That's, what, that's all about what you can do. As I said, everything is free. No excuse, right? Time could be excuse, but anyway. Uh, all right. By the way, uh, as Srinivas said, you can connect me. Actually, you cannot connect me on LinkedIn. My connections are full. Uh, so you can follow me. And this is the QR code. Um, I post frequently, rather regularly, on AI-related issues. Um, so I'm done. And then open it up for questions. Just one thing. If the questions are generic, useful to others, ask here. Or else you can ask later, if there are one-on-one -on -one questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yogesh. I mean, certainly it was a very, very insightful uh, session. In ah. fact, while coming to this session, I read one quote that uh, AI will replace you, but people, uh, AI will not replace you, but people know AI will definitely replace you. But after going through session, I must say that what is a, my takeaway is like a, AI will not replace you if you use AI to transfer you. <laughs> and def you sh you shared those simple tricks and tricks. I hope ego issues, inertia, or time excuse will not uh, block you to go ahead. Uh, with that, I know we are on the verge of, uh, I mean, 40 minutes. So those who have, I, I am pretty sure that there are lots of questions on your mind. And as Yogesh sir already offered that he is available for one-on-one -on -one conversations with everyone. So feel free to uh, get in touch with you. I hope I'm allowed to. <laughs> say that yeah so uh, with that note i mean uh, thank you so much we are really blessed and uh, thank you for sharing your uh, valuable time to give insights uh, we would like to uh, uh, felicitate yoga sir but before that i wanted you to give a huge round of applause for his insightful sessions as well as for my co-host whom i didn't introduce you my little co-host tanvi <laughs> 
Tanvi is a 11th grade uh, student and she has come to me said that I would like to co-host and help you to understand how exactly the conference is run and how to we have to this and really hats off her to courage and <laughs> thank you yeah so with that note uh, let me just quickly uh, invite Sakshi uh, to felicitate Miss Yogi sir. Once again, thank you so much. And this is the Menti link. Feel free to share your uh, valuable inputs on this link. Uh, you may seem the challenge with the internet, but you can just note down this code or take the picture and feel free wherever you are. Able. Once again, thank you. Uh, the apprehension, the seniority, right, which, which may come in your way. So, yeah, so as I said, for non-technical guys, non-coder guys, it would be the user persona one should be familiar with. Uh, but still, I would at least ask you to go through the uh, playlists that are available on uh, whatever, YouTube. So terminologies have to be very clear to you. If somebody says, I'm doing regression, you have to understand what this guy is saying. So at least lingo-wise, you should be very clear. You need not do the coding part. So persona, learn some low-code, no-code platforms. So platforms like Nime, K-N-I-M-E, Nime, Veka, and some cloud providers like Microsoft, they have ML Studio, which is drag drop. You should be able to use that. So the whole asset of seniority is, as I said, is domain expertise. You should never leave that. AI is just coming and probably helping us solve the problem. By the way, uh, in my previous job, we solved one specific problem. I'll talk about the problem. Given a document, find some important entities from it. Right? This is called as NER, named entity recognition. We can solve this problem by if and else, writing code, regular expressions. You can solve this problem by machine learning. You can solve the same problem by deep learning. And you can solve the same problem by prompt engineering. Problem remains. Only the tools changes. So your domain expertise, seniority is still valid. Just learn a new tool to do it. Yeah. Maybe last question, you had one, or that's the same one? Okay. So, uh, knowing AI is, is not optional these days. Right? You have to know it, whichever profile you have, right? be it a student or a manager. Only thing, the depth changes, as I mentioned, persona-wise. Thank you.